Hey everybody, uh, thanks for having me here. I just wanna say first of all, uh, I'm truly honored to be here. This is uh, really cool to talk to so many awesome smart people and be at a company that I've watched um, you know, uh, as a fan almost my whole adult life, so I just really appreciate it. My name is Aaron Aders. I'm the founder of Lease Technologies and I'm absolutely obsessed with snowboarding. <laughs> There's just something about uh, that movement and that feeling of snowboarding that's just incredible. And it's so incredible that you've got 39 million people around the world spending $2 billion a year to enjoy it for only five days a year on average. Just five days a year. Like, would you play basketball five days a year? <laughs> or soccer or anything else for just five days a year? Maybe, but with snowboarding, it really is that incredible. It's that worth it. But obviously we have a lot of the, the year we're on the sidelines just hanging out. Now, I know a lot of you might not be snowboarders, so what I'm about to show you, you might not grasp the full reality, <laughs> the full gravity of that. So if you could just for a moment think about something that uh, is a, an activity that you can only enjoy five days a year. Maybe it's traveling, uh, like a fishing trip maybe, or climbing a mountain. Think about, think about that experience for a second. And, and those feelings that you have enjoying this. And now, imagine if somebody told you, you can enjoy this experience and have these feelings on demand anywhere in the world, after work, on the weekends, whenever you want. That's basically what we've done for snowboarders. And so, uh, what is it about snowboarding that makes it so incredible? And it's, it's a combination of speed and turning and carving, which is uh, you know leaning into your 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 carves, uh, your turns rather, but it's it's this controlled drift I think that is really that that addicting part. And the drift, it's it's something that you know from the first time you ran and slid across your kitchen floor, or drifted out the back uh, tire of your bike or your scooter as a kid, or you know doing donuts around your high school parking lot. It's there's something just addicting about that. And snowboarding is really unique because it, it takes that drift and puts you in total control. And so you can spin and you can slide, and there's really just nothing else like it. And, uh, and so, so that is just, just so unique to snowboarding. It's something that has just never existed anywhere else. Another great thing about snowboarding is that community aspect. So sharing this adrenaline with your friends and, uh, and, and going out and snowboarding with them. And, and sometimes, you know, given that snowboarding is just a five day a year experience, you might only see these friends five days a year, or at least just enjoying this, this experience with them for only five days. And so all of these things together, snowboarding can be a little bit of a frustrating sport most of the year. And so that's what we set out to change. And we are a group of snowboarders that all share that dream of riding all year round. And I can tell you, getting to that point where we can enjoy the sport all year round as a snowboarder, it's, it really is a dream come true. And so what does it look like? <laughs> it's kind of hard to uh, describe in words somebody actually snowboarding in Dubai or around the world. So I'll just show you a quick video that'll show the, uh, the uh, capabilities of the leaf. So there's a lot going on there, <laughs> but essentially you can, you can just think of the leaf that we've taken the mechanics of snowboarding and traded the potential energy that a mountain gives you, mountain slope, and uh, for the electronic uh, uh, mechanical energy of uh, electronic motors. 
And so really the, uh, the key secret sauce to our system is this 360 drive that you see here. So this is really a, a caster wheel, just like you see on the bottom of a shopping cart with a motor strapped to it <laughs> and uh, transmitting energy through uh, a slip ring and going into a battery pack and controlled by your hand. And so those, those drive wheels, the base of it, are a little bit lower to the ground. And you can see in the tilting and drifting part, the outer edge wheels, they function just like a snowboard. So the edges on your snowboard. And that's really there for just steering and control and braking. And the rest is you. Uh, your, your whole body controls this, this crazy experience just like a snowboard. And it's really almost magical. If you know how to snowboard, and you, you take all of those, that muscle memory and that experience and you jump on the, the leaf and you can channel that through, it just works. In fact, it only works if you ride it just like a snowboard. So how do you stop? Very important question. <laughs> you stop just like a snowboard. So sliding on your edge wheels, just like you slide on the edge of a snowboard, it's the most fun and most effective way of stopping. You can go from our top speed of 23 miles an hour to a dead stop in less than two car lengths. Which if you try that on you know, a bike or something else, you might you know, go over the handlebars, but you're leaning into that, that slide and that force so you can stop really hard and, and be really comfortable. So it gives you a lot of control when you're at top speed. And you might have noticed there's these, these hooks that kind of fit over your feet. And this adds a ton of control, just like a snowboard. Now with a snowboard, you're locked on. And so you can't, uh, there's no safety bailout with a snowboard, uh, but you have snow under you, so it's okay. But when you're operating over pavement, you definitely want to have uh, the ability to jump off. And it's funny, once you, once you get rolling on the leaf for a while and you go back to snowboarding, uh, you're, you're kind of weirdly freaked out by the, the ability you can't jump off, so it kind of takes a couple runs to get back into it. But that's a key feature and uh, a must for getting out of these footholds. And so on the acceleration, it's a wireless remote control. And so you can think of this as kind of controlling your mountain slope. And so if you have it all the way forward, the gas pedal completely hammered down, that's like a triple black diamond, like dropping in, just getting off super fast. Uh, or you can just really lightly move the controller forward, and it can be like a nice bunny hill slope. But the nice thing is, is that at any point in time, if you get nervous, uh, if you get a little bit out of control, you can let go and the motors will just coast and eventually will come to a stop. And so really it's a bit like snowboarding, but you can make the mountain go away anytime you want. And then we made the battery swappable because if you're a snowboarder, even if you've never dreamed about snowboarding uh, on city streets, you've definitely dreamed about the endless slope. Because at some point you get to the bottom of the mountain, which is a total drag. <laughs> so you have to wait in line, get in the lift up. And so you always dream about that endless slope. And we wanted that ability. And so for us, the endless slope is getting to the end of a battery, not having to go home and charge it, but rather just switch out another battery and keep going. And these batteries will go up to 15 miles on our largest size. And so far, I haven't seen anybody go past three batteries. That's been kind of the human limit of fun at, at this point. Oh yeah, so before I get into this part, <laughs> um, uh, this, this project, I mean, from, from the, the beginning, I mean, that the crux of this was figuring out that powered cast reel. That was the thing that electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, investors, friends and family all told us was probably impossible. Um, but none of us are engineers, so we didn't have that experience to kind of think it was impossible. We just knew this had to happen. We just knew that if, if we could bring this experience to 365 days a year, the, 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 the idea is just so big and such a big life improvement for snowboarders. And so we just, we, they didn't understand we had to make it happen. And so um, we, we had to kind of go the bootstrapping route, especially since we didn't have uh, a lot of funding. And, um, and again, you know, when we were pitching investors in the beginning, trying to convince them to snowboard everywhere, um, they just, n nobody would believe. Even Kickstarter didn't believe, in fact. When we launched our Kickstarter, they flagged us for spam because they thought it was fake. And luckily, I, I was, we, we built this in Brooklyn, Kickstarter's in Brooklyn, so when I got that email, I was pretty annoyed because it was real. 
And so we just grabbed the board, uh, rode over to Kickstarter's headquarters, and just did laps in their lobby until they launched our campaign, which only took about an hour. But we got up and were up and running. But there were a number of lessons that we learned along the way, because when we, we started this, it was kind of early in a lot of hardware projects happening now, but, but a few years ago, it was, it was uh, kind of disparate. And there wasn't like a, uh, a tutorial out there or even you know, a roadmap on how to bootstrap hardware. But we, learned, we, we were able to do it, and we learned a lot of lessons on the way, so I'll share those with you. Uh, number one, YouTube is the matrix. <laughs> and what I mean by that uh, is my favorite part of the matrix wasn't like dodging bullets or flying. It was like downloading skills to your brain you know, instantly. That was what I was most fascinated about. If I could take anything from the matrix and put it in real life, that's what I would pick. And that's what YouTube is in a way. I mean, I'm not an engineer. I knew nothing about uh, what we, all, the, all these, this technology that we had to put together for this board. And I remember it was like one lazy Thanksgiving afternoon. Everybody had eaten. We're just kind of all laying around. And I thought, wow, I'd really rather be snowboarding right now. <laughs> and I had an electric skateboard at the time, and I was thinking, like, this would just be so, such a better experience if it felt like snowboarding. It would be game changing. And so I started kind of thinking about those pieces of my electric skateboard. And I started searching, OK, uh, lithium ion batteries was a big feature. I knew nothing. What is a lithium ion battery? And I found on YouTube a lecture from Carnegie Mellon, 90 minutes about lithium ion battery technology. And that was four years ago. I've, we've actually gone through a lot, built this product. I know maybe 5% more than I did that day after watching that lecture. And you know, I watched it. And I, and it was like kind of like I you know, unplugged the matrix and was like, I know lithium ion batteries. <laughs> and then I was like, OK, how do I, how do I go to the next piece? How, uh, how do you uh, put electricity through a rotating circuit? And it turns out there's these things called slip rings that I didn't even know about. And they're, they're in everything. A headphone jack, in fact, is a slip ring. And so I saw a few videos on those. And we kind of had to reinvent the slip ring a little bit. But the, the, the main idea was there. I knew, OK, we've. There's got to be a slip ring. There's got to be ele uh, electronic batteries. There's got to be motors. And you know, in a, a lazy afternoon, you can surprisingly get a lot done on YouTube <laughs> if you spin it the right way, of course. But uh, my biggest, uh, I guess, advice to even engineers is if, if you don't know anything about the technology, there's probably a YouTube video out there. And you know, even if it's some guy in his garage putting a tutorial, sometimes those are the best ones. Um, Next, uh, we, we kind of came up with a way of doing PR, and we call it a downstairs demo. And so traditionally with PR, um, it's a big part of, of bootstrapping something, because you don't have an ad budget, and you probably can't even hire a PR agent. And so you've got to get you know, organic articles out there that you aren't paying for. And uh, traditionally, you, know, you, you research your, the writers that you think you, you can, uh, that would be interested in what you're doing. You look at their interests, the topics that they, they like, and how you can position your company. And you write an awesome email that you send at 10 AM on Tuesday to kind of catch them in between tasks. But the problem is everybody's doing that. You know, they're getting thousands of emails at 10 AM on Tuesday. And unfortunately, most likely, it won't get read. And so you have to take it a step further and, and what we call the downstairs demo. And the first step to that is find out where they work, the address to where they work. This is getting creepy, but just hang in there with me for a second. So you find out where they work, um, and you show up maybe an hour before or after lunch, maybe the last hour of the day, and you get up to their lobby. You're not going to get past the lobby, but don't worry, you don't have to get past the lobby. You just take uh, you know, your, your smartphone, and you film yourself using your device in their lobby or in front of their building if they kick you out of the lobby, or on the street if they make you get off the <laughs> foyer, which has happened. And in our case, you know, just doing donuts and saying, hey, look, you're one short elevator ride away from trying this crazy new tech. That got a 100% response rate. <laughs> Not everybody came down, but half the people came down, and all those people wrote about us. That's how we got in The Verge, Engadget, uh, Gizmodo, and a lot of big publications. The other half of the people, all said the exact same thing, which is, hey, I've been burned by you know, hardware startup uh, Kickstarter projects before, and I just can't write about you. And if you can figure that out before you show up to their lobby, that would be great. But you know, sometimes you just have to show up. But that's a, that's a big thing. I mean, we were lucky. We were in New York. 
and it was convenient. But when we did this, we, we did it in one to two days. And so quick trip to New York or LA or wherever, uh, if you're not in these areas, you can get a lot done. OK, so on the prototyping side, uh, you're going to need a 3D printer if you're prototyping hardware, because rapid prototyping is just, uh, it's, it's not rapid. <laughs> you know, you're talking one to, you know, one to three days on the fastest turnaround time, and it's incredibly expensive. In fact, on the first you know, two models you might send to rapid prototyping, you could actually buy a 3D printer. And once you make that one to $3,000 investment for a 3D printer, it's almost free. And you can obviously iterate your, uh, your prototypes a lot faster by printing them at home because you, are, you have become essentially a rapid prototyper. But there's ways to even speed it up beyond that. So for example, um, say you've got a small motor mount that's part of your, your project and you've got eight features that, you know, holes or things that fit into other things um, as part of your project. And you have to dial in each one at a time. Now say this little motor mount only takes an hour to, to print, which is a pretty fast print, okay? You've got eight features. Each one will say it takes two or three kind of prints to get it right. That's 20 prints you have to make to dial in that one motor mount. Now that's still light speed compared to rapid prototyping. You won't even get an email back from the company in 20 hours but you can go way faster. And that is by printing in 2D rather than 3D. And so if you've got that, that motor mount and you're trying to dial in a hole, you can actually just print a one millimeter layer face and you know, peel it off, get your calipers out, measure it, dial it in. And you can print that one millimeter layer in two minutes. So 20 prints, instead of 20 hours, you just turn it into 40 minutes of printing. And that's how you can dial in entire parts in an afternoon. Um, and that was a big, big lesson kind of we learned along that way. And, you know, it look, took literally days to kind of get all this stuff together and, uh, and, and be on the road. Uh, definitely iterate with off-the-shelf components. And this isn't anything, a, a new idea, but you definitely have to kind of think about um, <laughs> some of the constraints uh, that might come with those off-the-shelf components. And we had to deal with one in particular that was <laughs> a little scary. So our first version of this, we basically took apart an electronic helicopter, put the motors on a shopping cart wheel, and put that onto a skateboard, and, uh, and we were off and running. And what we didn't realize, though, um, is a feature of electronic helicopters, which is great when you're, when you're flying, um, if, you, if you lose radio signal, it'll go uh, full speed to stay in the air. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you guys understand where I'm going with this. <laughs> We'd be riding around. And in New York City, maybe the most dense place of 2.4 gigahertz uh, networks. And when you lose signal, you go full speed <laughs> for a good like one to two seconds until it kind of gets back. So it was kind of this mechanical bull that you had to be just ready to go full speed at any given time. And so we kind of learned with these parts, OK, you know, we, we learned these constraints. And so a lot of the off-the-shelf parts, you kind of have to read a lot more of the directions than you might be prepared to uh, before you get going. Um, then the mobile lab. So you definitely, with hardware, uh, you're going to be doing a lot of field testing. And in the beginning, you're going to be doing a lot more fixing than actually testing in the field. And those, those minutes that you know, turn into hours and eventually turn into days of testing, they're like gold in the beginning. And you know, when you're out in the field and something breaks, which in the beginning will happen in the first two minutes, uh, you know, you don't want to have to go back to the office, you know, 45 minute train ride and go fix it and then go back out to the field. You need to take your mobile lab with you. And so obviously there's like a lot of mechanical things that are built for going with you, like electronic drills, wrenches, things like that. But eventually, you know, you're going to have to solder. <laughs> and uh, soldering irons, unfortunately, take a lot of current because uh, they have to get really hot. And you only always have a plug with you, especially um, if you're you know, going around New York City testing your product. So you have to find plugs around, but they exist. You know, we've soldered um, outside a public bathroom in Central Park. Uh, I've soldered in a coat closet at the Plaza Hotel. They were nice enough to let me get in there and solder. Uh, they, they have these random plugs in the ceilings in the subway that you can, you can dial into and get enough current to solder. But just bring the whole lab with you. Like, don't, don't think you have to go back and just, you know, carry everything around. If you've got to drag a wagon with you, it's really worth it because, again, it's going to be two minutes of testing and 
two hours of fixing in the beginning. And so, um, you know, I could go on and on about hardware stories, uh, startups, but I think maybe this is a good time to just switch it over to uh, a Q&A. And again, I just really appreciate everybody coming out to hear our story and the invitation. Thanks so much. Okay. And we have a question cube. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. I'm going to try to. Awesome. Nicely done. Um, so the big difference I see um, in terms of the, between this and boring skateboarding is the terrible things you're doing to the wheels. Um, so, uh, so that you said that people go through three batteries, which then have to take home and recharge. How often do they have to replace the wheels? Really good question. So in skateboarding, you have uh, a couple factors that go into your wheels. Uh, one is kind of rebound, how, how, how bouncy it is. Another one's called a durometer, which is how hard it is. Mm -hmm. And so they have durometers from like, you know, like jelly all the way to hard plastic. And the skateboard wheels fall somewhere in between. And so the harder durometer will last longer because it just resists that, uh, that abrasion a little bit better. And also, it slides better. <laughs> because uh, it's not gripping that pavement. And so we use uh, a bit harder durometer wheels than probably the average skateboard would, skateboarder would consider our wheels a bit hard on that durometer side. But again, it kind of works with that sliding and it lasts a lot longer. And also a key, so you can tell a little bit in this, in this image, so the outside of the wheels are kind of getting dirty and they, they start to cone. And so whenever you get too much wear, you just flip the wheel 180 degrees. And then you start working on the other side. <laughs> and then you flip it again, and you flip it again. And you might get six flips before you have to change the wheels. When I had a, a, it was a five mile round trip commute in Brooklyn, a set of wheels when flipped regularly would last about six months. On this? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Okay. But when you're commuting, you're not obviously doing a bunch of 360s and things. You know, you got a place to be. So. <laughs> yeah, but, but even so. But even so, yeah, you can, you can make a set of wheels last a very long time. Uh, so uh, when you're saying you're going with um, a harder material, um, what's the, um, what kind of snow skittiness does this, does this correspond to? Is it like a prepared piste or a morning somewhat frozen over? Or just the skid, the braking performance you have look pretty good, so it, feels, it looks like it feels like a pretty soft snow. Yeah, I would say the, in the most ideal scenario, which um, is a nice kind of broken in wheel and super smooth, uh, it's really the pavement actually that kind of determines the feeling the, more than anything. Um, if you're on like a garage floor, say like a really slick uh, concrete, uh, it's, it's, de it's not like ice, but it's definitely like a really hard pack, we'll say. Uh, but the best is kind of a, a nice uh, kind of blacktop, like a, like a fresh street. That just feels like a, a nice groomer, like you got the first groomer run of the day and you're just, just jetting super fast. Uh, I'd say it's kind of more like that. Thank you. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, this is really awesome. Can you talk a little bit more about how you like eject from the board or how the straps come off? Like, can you adjust the... <laughs> the degree to which you're strapped in and then like how does the trigger work i noticed two buttons in your video yeah so uh straps first we where we go okay here we go so <laughs> chris actually did that and i told him i said okay you're gonna have to catch a front edge <laughs> and, and bail out which if you do this on a snowboard there's no there's no turning back <laughs> i mean you're gonna you're gonna go face down so uh, we probably should have this in slow-mo, but more or less when you're to get out and eject really easily, you, the, the, the footholds are kind of out from the edge. So when you're riding, you're putting outward pressure with your feet to really like hold in and, and kind of maintain that position. But to get out, you just bring your feet together. And if you bring your feet together, you can even jump forward. But if you don't, you know, you can jump backwards or whatever. But um, yeah, we're kind of trained and you get a muscle memory after doing it a couple times of just like hopping together and, and getting out. And you can adjust the height and how tight it is and things like that. So you, I, I ride a little bit looser because I like to be able to jump out uh, very easily. And so, um, but you want that control. You want to be able to really like press in because that's really going to give you 
that board control. Um, on the remote control, so there's a trigger and a thumb wheel. And that's really, you can, you can find that on most uh, wireless remote electronic rideables because there's the, the safety or dead man switch, which, is, which in our case is the trigger. And then there's the thumb wheel, which is the accelerator. And there's kind of two schools of thought and the, the skateboarding, or electric skateboarding community is kind of split down the middle. And it's just whether you have the dead man switch on your thumb or your forefinger and you have the, the uh, accelerator on your thumb or the forefinger. So the other way of doing it is putting the dead man switch on your thumb and then the trigger kind of like you know the old little RC cars. The reason we didn't go that route is because we do find that some people, when they crash, they grip, you know? <laughs> and, and you definitely don't want to go full speed. And so um, even in our case, uh, if you grip, you're not going to you know, likely move the thumb wheel forward. But uh, moving the thumb wheel backward will actually provide electronic braking, which typically we only use if you're in like a tight space and you can't turn sideways to, to brake. But, um, the sliding to brake, I mean, that's the most fun, the most effective, and it actually got us uh, about less than half the, the product insurance rate as a, as a normal electric skateboard because uh, with those brakes, they're, they're all electronic, and you, you can lose your brakes by losing uh, the wireless signal, breaking a belt, um, or uh, going over 25 miles an hour, which there's too much momentum to stop you. And so, so that provides a lot of stability and safety. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I have actually like dreamed about snowboarding to work and snowboarding <laughs> on roads. So, <laughs> yeah, it's here. <laughs> if you could talk a little bit about your background, what what you were doing uh, before you started this? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I actually uh, I co-founded a marketing agency with a couple of buddies uh, when I was 24 years old, and. Um, it was uh, doing a lot of uh, digital marketing, a lot of SEO, so Google was obviously very uh, relevant to our daily lives in that agency. And, uh, you know, but I'm a lifelong snowboarder. This is something, you know, that I, I always dreamed of. Um, I actually had started a version of that company when I was in high school, and uh, my junior year, I actually moved out of my parents' house and started just snowboarding all the time and barely graduated. But it was always, uh, I kind of, my dream, my, my dream thing, because I'm from Indiana originally, and it's super flat, but there's a lot of snow, and I would only get to ride once a year, and so dreaming about that um, at the end of every snowboard trip, just, it's always been kind of in the back of my head, but yeah, I, I had a background of, you know, starting a, a company before, and so when, on that Thanksgiving uh, day, when, when this, this thing got in my head, it just couldn't get out, and so uh, eventually, when, when Leaf started growing and, and needing more of my time, I switched over full time uh, from my agency to Leaf Tech. Can you tell a bit how do you see uh, the involvement of that, the next model or the next generation? How do you see this product going even further? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that. Lithium ion battery technology is going to define a lot of the direction because we've, we've really nailed the experience in terms of uh, that snowboarding feeling. And I think that future products uh, from us will, will, will maybe get a little bit more dialed in on that. I mean, that, that feature is, is really nice, but I think it's more about just being lighter, possibly being faster, but um, really just, and, and getting the price down, I think, uh, could, could help a bit. And that'll come with volume as we as we grow, but you know, just really you know, serving these 39 million snowboarders around the world. That's that's our dream is just to to grow our beloved sport and and make it a year-round uh, type initiative. You just led into the question I've been holding back. Um, so with with a, a skateboard, I can see a point with putting the battery pack on the board because you routinely do actually take your feet off the board. Um, but with this, when you're traveling strapped in, you've got much less reason to keep, your, uh, keep the battery back on the board. Um, so you could wear it. Um, and you just mentioned that the board is heavy. Are you implying that the board with all the stuff on it is heavier than a snowboard and a pair of de depressingly heavy boots? Well, actually, it's about equal. So because you have so much gear on when you're snowboarding. Yeah. So if you threw you know, your boots, your jacket, your pants, uh, gloves and all these things in a pile with their snowboard, it's, it's about the same weight. And so, you know, we're still talking, you know, 15, 16 pounds 
um, on our smallest model. But you know, I mean, the, the, the dream is to go even lighter. If if you don't, if you're not living in New York or San Francisco, you're probably not walking a lot with the board. So uh, it's not really an issue for most people. Uh, just throw in the back of their car. But we definitely want it to be lighter. I mean, that's just probably a better experience all around. And you know, I do believe that you know one day you'll buy a cell phone with all the energy you'll ever need for it. Um, and so hopefully that'll happen with the same uh, with our board as well. So um, I think the design of your straps is really interesting. And I was wondering if you've explored. Um, so I, I have one of those surf style skateboards with the, I don't know if you've seen these, where the front trucks really um, turn a lot. Yeah, it's got so a castle wheel kind of. Well, yeah, it, that, yeah, it pivots, right. That kind of thing. It's made by a company, a local company called Carver, the one that yeah. I have. And, uh, and I love it, but you can't easily ollie with that skateboard um, because it's a little bit unstable. It occurs to me that like, if, if I had straps, kind of like your straps, I could probably jump up curbs um, without a problem with that. And it might be an interesting uh, thing to try. I don't know. Have you, when you were prototyping this stuff, did you try it uh, on, on some more standard kind of uh, skateboards? Well, they're a bit scary on a skateboard. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. One, it's, it's kind of hard to push and then get back in. But the second thing is, I mean, you can't slide and stop. So you really, really, really don't want to be locked in. I mean, that's why with a skateboard, electric skateboard has to be completely clean on the top so you can you know, kind of move around and get your stance. But for us, you know, you're really fixed on the outside. And so that ability to slide and stop, I mean, that's what the, the food wheels really help you with. But on a skateboard, um, again, it's, it, if you're not pushing, then um, you don't have to worry about moving back in to push if you have it electronic. But again, like, uh, it's, it's a little scary just because you can't, you can't slide and stop. I see. Yeah, the, the thing about pushing is like with with those special trucks that I was talking about, yeah. you can you can basically you, you barely need to push. You can just go side to side and car. Oh, the pumping, uh, right? Yeah, and pump. Yeah. But but yeah, I get the. Yeah. It's the stopping part that's scary. Yes. <laughs> How do you stop on this thing? I mean, uh, I guess sometimes you can jump off. Uh, you can do a, a power slide type thing. Oh, okay. Getting on your wheels. Yeah, maybe if you like got over that uh, that caster and maybe you're able to slide, get a little friction, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, I, I find them scary on um, almost anything else. But yeah, we have tried that. Uh, you definitely want to be able to turn and stop. Has anyone ever done anything that you weren't expecting them to do with the board? Um, well, I think that, you know, the. The hardest part of this project wasn't getting the thing invented, actually. That, we did that in about five months, from you know, just a, an empty desk with drawings to actually a thing on the ground that you, know, you could slide and stop. The, the hard part was getting it to something that a consumer is not going to break in the first 10 minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think consumers will do like, things with your product that you wouldn't <laughs> imagine. Uh, you know, sitting on the, the, the motherboard, for example. <laughs> um, but I think some of the, the more surprising thing was just kind of how quickly a lot of people have picked it up. Um, you know, I think in my case it was a little different because I was writing prototypes of break constantly, so it kind of took me forever to learn. But seeing how quickly people jump on and just start sliding around, I mean, it just blows my mind sometimes. I'm like, wow, it took me you know, hours to get to that point, and they they literally just kind of jumped off. But the the key thing was was dialing in the, the snowboard feel. And so, if you snowboard, we actually have you close your eyes <laughs> when we put you on the board for the first time, and we we control the speed, uh, and we you know we let you we hold a shoulder so you have a little bit of stability. But if you close your eyes and you imagine you're on the snow, it just it just happens immediately just magically. Um, but then when you open your eyes and you, you, know, you see the pavement and all these other things that kind of make you nervous, uh, then you know, you, you've, you've got to kind of, kind of learn to get over that. But what we learned from doing a lot of demos is if somebody has snowboarding experience, just blindfold them, make their close their eyes, do something, because then they'll feel that in the first 10 seconds. And once they, they feel that slide, because <laughs> it, it really does feel like snow, because you're kind of going sideways and like 
that just doesn't happen anywhere else, um, then, then they're hooked. Then they will, they will go through and, and fall or do anything to kind of have that, that feeling again. And so that was like a, a big thing we learned uh, going on is like get a user in sliding as, as quickly as possible. So you're saying that it's pretty easy to learn if I don't know how to snowboard, but I don't know how to skateboard? You're actually better off. Okay. <laughs> the, in fact, the, the best candidate that, that we could ask for that's never got on our board before is somebody that has never skateboarded because there are certain things you have to unlearn from skateboarding. If you ride this like a skateboard, it just won't work. You'll be super frustrated. Um, somebody with snowboarding experience, obviously, but also a surfer. So if you can surf and snowboard, you'll pick it up pretty quickly. Because surfing, I mean, you learn that, that middle balance point. Because you know, learning to surf, it feels like you're, you're on ice. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. But you really learn to kind of balance over. And that's a key thing in the beginning. Because when we start people on the board, we don't put them under the footholds in the beginning. Because you know, they got to kind of learn how to bail off. And so without those footholds to pull the board around, you really have to maintain that center balance. And we find that surfers uh, do really well with that. So, like people from Brazil just jump on the board and they're just like gone. They they pick it up really quickly. <laughs> How much is this board? So uh, the ten mile model starts at fifteen forty nine. Okay. And uh, hopefully, if you're <coughs> watching this video in a few years, it's a lot less. <laughs> okay. And the last question. So I I remember a while ago I saw this. Ad, I don't know if this maybe this is the same company, uh, Freeboard. Basically, yes. it looks like kind of looks like this just without the motor. Yeah, so really, I mean, we definitely invented a few things along the way, but I, I mean, at, at a high level, we just took existing tech and just put it in, combined it in different ways. So um, the freeboard plus the boosted, you can kind of think of as Because yeah, I remember thinking exactly that, like, oh, I wish it would just go on flat then. But, so. <laughs> yeah, no, when I, when I saw that for the first time, um, it was like, I've never had a religious experience, but when I saw that, it was like, it just, it was, it was incredible. Uh, but then I did some research and, well, you have to have a hill. And yeah. I was living in Manhattan. There's like no hills. Uh, I, was, I was even going to buy just to ride in a parking garage. But as a skateboarder, I know you get kicked out of parking garages like instantly. So uh, I was kind of back to square one. But uh, you know, when Boosted came out, and, and they were the first to use the AC motors, these really tiny motors. And, uh, and I got one, and I was like, OK. I, I think it's possible now. But again, that you know, putting strapping it to a caster wheel, no one thought that was possible. Absolutely zero, nobody. <laughs> uh, so do you think people can use this to like uh, train for snowboarding? Like yeah, someone and someone who wants a snowboard but doesn't know how to do it yet? Yeah, so uh, we definitely do we, we want to be the gateway drug to snowboarding, <laughs> you know, for people in areas that don't have snow. And uh, I love so, snowboarding so much, and I just respect this sport so much that, you know, when we launched, I felt inherently that this could make people better. But I didn't want to uh, make that claim up front saying, this is going to make you a better snowboarder. But that is the feedback we're getting from our customers, uh, especially people that have only been a couple times, and they're really new to the sport, and they get the leaf. Um, and uh, you know, one of my, my favorites was uh, a customer we have in Singapore that he'd been on a couple trips, was just obsessed with the sport, got our board. He went, he went on a snowboarding trip with some buddies. Um, meanwhile, bought our board. He, he got back to Singapore, rode his board for three weeks, went on another snowboarding trip and, uh, with the same buddies. And they all were like, you, you just had a whole season. What happened? Like, <laughs> you got way better. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's the thing. I mean, when you're snowboarding, when you take into account lift lines and lifts and lunch and you know the first day you're going to be smoked in the first couple hours you might only have of like real actual riding you know just a few hours a day and so you know if you can get out with the the leaf uh and one battery will last you a few hours and you can charge that a couple times a day i mean you can get seasons of riding in literally weeks so so yeah we were really happy to see that it was actually improving uh people's riding and and when we were in New York, we actually had somebody, um, it was this eye banker called us up and said, hey, I've got to be at this, uh, this snowboarding mountain to, to kind of do a customer meeting and ride with them. And I don't, I don't know how to snowboard. If I buy your board, can I, can I get up to speed and learn? Awesome. And 
Uh, I was like, yeah, I, I think so. And we actually connected him with one of our uh, pro riders in New York to kind of show him the ropes. And uh, I don't know if he closed the deal, but, I'm, but uh, he was super happy and, and actually rode. So, so yeah, it can definitely uh, get you into the sport. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so when you ollie, do you try to land uh, on the front wheels? Because if you land on the motors, it might easily damage it. Um, actually, all the force uh, bypasses the motors. Oh. So you actually want to land on your, on your okay, base. Okay, so flat. Yeah, I mean, a more experienced rider can kind of land on an edge um, or something like that, but landing flat is really what you want to do. And, and yeah, you're coming down on those casters, but the way that the, the mechanical system, you might be able to tell, if I could pause this, it's an animated GIF, but um, the motor is really just kind of hanging off a, a mount on the front. And so all that load is going straight through the wheel into the deck and you know, through you and then back down, but it kind of bypasses that motor. Really, the motor's just kind of hanging off and the only load on the motor is the timing belt. So it's built, I mean, uh, we've done seven stair gaps, which is, you know, maybe, yay, high. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny. You just have to like channel that, that, that snowboarding feeling and that, those mechanics. If you, if you approach it like something new, it's super scary. But if, you, if you're like, oh, this is, you know, just imagine the snow, like channel your five-year-old self and like see the snow, it, it, it just magically works. It's crazy. Okay, so when you're dropping down from seven stairs, do you yeah. land like a power slide or more like a skateboard? Uh, you can. You, in fact, one of our riders, is, his name's Slide Jump Slide. <laughs> he slides, jumps. And lands on a slide. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a super challenging uh, trick. But, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, that's like the great thing about snowboarding and our board is like, there's just endless progression and endless styles. And so, so yeah, you can land sideways if you really want to. Okay, cool, thanks. Oh, do we have, okay. You talk a little bit about the, your industrial design process, and you, you talk a lot about wanting to, um, to, uh, to mirror the experience of snowboarding. So how did you think about that when you're designing the board and communicating the, the visual design to a consumer that may not you know, have seen the video? For sure. Um, so for us you know, to call this, I'm a snowboarder. And if this didn't feel like snowboarding, I have zero interest in it. And so in the beginning, that's, it's kind of how we got our name. So the touring test of our board was being able to like falling leaf down the street. So that's the first move you learn on snow. You're just kind of like falling leaf down the mountain. And so our board had to do that. Nothing else can, can falling leaf down, down a city street. And so we just kept iterating and, and getting into where, you know, we had enough torque to do that. You know, in the beginning, we were, we were literally burning the, the coils of the motors, but uh, it takes a lot of torque, um, a powered caster wheel. But in terms of the industrial design, um, honestly, th for, for the first version, uh, you can kind of tell for the generation of the person that, that designed it. It kind of looks like a, like, a, like a first NES or maybe the first PlayStation or something, this real edgy, dark, uh, you know, uh, device. But I think that, you know, when you see it and, and, and this, this thing popping out of the middle, I mean, obviously you're not going to put your feet there, but, you know, your feet are, you, you kind of have like a, a notion of, of, of kind of how to stand on it just, just naturally where that grip tape is and things. But... Um, yeah, I think with, with future versions, it can be a little bit maybe more communicated like a snowboard. Uh, also, the, you can't really tell in this photo, but there's, uh, it's, it's just bi-directional. There's technically no front to the board. Um, we, we do have some uh, traction control for, for beginners, so we're, we're sensing which direction the board's going and applying uh, power relative to that, that direction. So if you, you know, if you switch, you won't have like anti-traction control. <laughs> it's, gotta, it's gotta follow with you if you, if you go the other way. Um, and I think that kind of helps too, because when they get out of the box, they're like, you know, which way's forward, but it doesn't matter. It just, it knows which way's forward. But I, I think there's, yeah, the, definitely design-wise, um, we can pick up a lot uh, more in the next version. And uh, one other unrelated question. You mentioned that uh, you, you started up in, in New York and you know, this genre of product immediately made me think of Casey Neistat, who's a very popular YouTuber that's always 
messing around with electric, um, you know, modes of transportation. Yeah. Has, has he tried this yet? Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. We, um, he, I don't think he's tried it. We actually ran into him when we were beta testing. Uh, it was like 10 degrees January, New York, and there was nobody out except uh, one of our beta riders, uh, which is actually my brother. And, um, and he was testing all, along, uh, I don't know if you've been to New York, but there's like the Freedom Tower and there's this huge bike lane. It's really nice and smooth. And if it's 10 degrees out, nobody's on it. So he was out there, there going. And Casey was actually, um, you know how he rides his board and films himself. And he, he came up on our, uh, on our beta rider. And of course, like he, he threw this huge slide. He's like, what is that? And he stopped him. And um, he actually put us on his daily blog that day. And, uh, and yeah, our site was just like, I mean, it was like 12,000 visitors in the first you know, 20 minutes after he, he posted that. And all he did was just, uh, flo luckily, by, my brother had a, like one of our promo cards on him and just floated that out there. And we had a ton of traffic. Um, and he's a big snowboarder, and he does this like street snowboarding thing where he, he takes like a, I don't know, I think it's like a water ski rope behind a, a car <laughs> and snowboards around. So this is like a lot better for that than that. But uh, yeah, he's, he's kind of the perfect person. I, I know that he's really involved with Boosted, so I'm not sure if, if he has much interest, but um, maybe. You said something about traction control, and I was wondering if you could say a few things about the hardware that's inside kind of controlling the motors a little bit. Yeah, totally. Uh, so the traction control is remarkably simple. Uh, basically, you know, when you're, when you're going around a turn in a car and you start to slide out, they you know, slow down those back wheels and kind of you know, lessens that slide out a little bit. And so what we do is basically the same exact thing. We're just slowing down the back wheel. But again, without being you know, a front end, the back can kind of change. Mm -hmm. And so all who, basically we have um, just a set of positive magnets on one side, set of negative magnets on the other, hall sensor. And you know, if it's a positive reading, we know we're going this way. If it's a negative reading, we know we're going that way. And then um, if that changes, you just change the power going to each motor. Um, it happens in you know, milliseconds. And it's remarkably simple. I, uh, just like literally one hall sensor. Um, and I actually, the, there's like an organization around um, hall sensors and, and MIMS and sensors. And, and they, they found out somehow we were using that. And I went and I, I did a presentation at one of their conferences. And they were super excited until they found out I only had one hall sensor in the board. <laughs> and they were, I think, a little disappointed. They wanted us to buy more. Because <laughs> <But laughs> there were people with you know, MRI machines with thousands of hall sensors. And, and so, <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of unexpected and funny. <laughs> hey, I was just wondering, have you guys thought at all about maybe this product in the context of how like a skate park might evolve? Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about how skate jumps are very different, like a vert is very different than like a proper snowboard kicker, you know, the landing and how that works. And is there any thought of like, would this kind of a product work in that kind of environment, not just in like, you know, hitting stair gaps and, and rails, but also uh, more snowboard style jumps? Yeah, definitely. So have you ever heard of a pump track? Mm. So it's like these, this little track that's got these bumps. And if you're on a skateboard, you can kind of like yeah. pump and keep momentum going around. We thought those would be great, but the scale was just far too small. It was, you know, built for a little skateboard. Yeah. And with snowboarding, you know, you've got these massive runs that are like, yeah. you know, sometimes 10 lanes wide. Right. And, you know, carving across those, I mean, it's just, you know, it makes your whole day. And so there is definitely like a larger scale that needs to happen with that. And with a skate park, for me, um, I like more like flat, transition, so maybe more like a pyramid rather than like a quarter pipe. Right. I do find that, that that curve, at least for me, maybe my skills aren't, aren't good enough, but it kind of freaks me out. Um, and you know, I've never really tried that on a snowboard, so I couldn't really tell you. But what I do want to know and what I love doing on this board is those more like, what would be great is like a pyramid that would be like the size of this room right. um, with huge walls that you know kind of transition. Those are super fun. And I think that Definitely someday there will be kind of a park 
meant for these, but I think it's going to be at a, a much larger scale, just given kind of how snowboarding works and the fun parts of that. Cool. Yeah, and, and on that note, actually, we, you know, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but um, it's like a leaf resort. It's, it's incredible. Um, there's a, a huge loop around the park that's like four to six lanes wide. That's super fun to carve and, and get up to speed. But then there's all these little paths in the middle. And so it's, it's, it's very different experience, you know, traveling through these little paths and, and going on the, the, big, uh, the big outer ring. But, you know, that, that's kind of fun to kind of experience with that. But when we came to uh, Los Angeles and, you know, we, we rode up Griffith Park, which is one of our favorite runs, I mean, that was an even, I'd never like used the same product and had such a different experience. <laughs> um, you know, being on literally the side of a mountain going up that hill uh, to Griffith Park. And so it's, uh, it, was, it just blew our minds. It was way different. And I think there's just so many different contexts you can enjoy this board. But I think that bigger, wider is, is really nice. How easy is it to bring the board on a plane? Yeah, so we, uh, we designed the batteries so that they're, they're uh, compliant with TSA regulations. And so I usually carry on the board. Um, you always have to carry on the battery and the remote control since there's a battery inside. You can check the board if you like. Um, I've actually carried on two boards. They were super annoyed, but they let me through with it. Um, and, and yeah, it just fits in the overhead. And a lot of our customers take them everywhere. And that was you know, a, a key feature we really had to have it. And that's why you see our, our battery packs are actually two batteries, because to stay under the watt hour limit, we had to split the pack. And we can get a lot more mileage and, and stay under that limit. Everybody ready to ride? <laughs> cool, let's do it. <laughs> All right, Appreciate it.